Principles of Finance with Excel Modeling, Copyright Lou Gattis, Topic 3, Cost of Capital, WAC, Cost of Debt, and Cost of Equity. A good source for this is Beninga's textbook on Sections 6, and, uh, 6 2 and 6 5 on WAC and Chapter 13 on CAPM. In this topic, we're going to calculate something called the Cost of Capital. Now, the Cost of Capital refers to the rate of return required by providers of capital. And for firms, we're talking about debt holders and equity holders. It's appropriate to use this cost of capital as the discount rate to compute the fundamental value or the intrinsic value of the firm or the stock. So in this chapter, we'll compute the required return for debt holders using several methods. The required return for equity holder using the CAPM model, weighted average cost of capital or WAC, and then use WAC and free cash flows to the firm to value stocks using a growth perpetuity. So we can think of WAC as the firm's cost of capital. When the firm needs to raise funds, how much does it have to pay back? How much does it owe to the capital providers? WAC is the firm's cost of capital that accounts for both sources of funding, both debt and equity. Again, remember debt you can think of as bank loans or bonds. And when we talk about the cost of funding a debt, we call it the cost of debt. It's usually written as KD or RD. However, remember from accounting class that interest payments uh, paid to bondholders uh, or interest payments paid to, to, to banks are tax deductible. Therefore, the after-tax cost of debt would be KD times 1 minus the corporate tax rate. And remember that bonds are just loans made to corporations, and they're going to be discussed even more in later sections. Now, equity or ownership in a firm, uh, the, cost, the, the, the required return that you have to give to your equity holders is called the cost of equity, written either KE or RE. Now, a stockholder owns a fraction of the firm. and in, in fact, uh, the number of shares they own divided by the total shares outstanding is the percent ownership uh, to that shareholder. Now, shoulder, shareholders uh, share in the profit of a company through dividend payments, and they also earn return from the appreciation of the stock. Now, dividend payments are not tax deductible and are only paid after debt obligations are satisfied. So here's our formula for the weighted average cost of capital, or WAC. It is the cost of equity, that required return we believe our shareholders deserve or require, times the equity financing as a percent of total funding. That is the market cap of the stock, the total value of stock outstanding in market value terms over the total value of equity and debt, plus the after-tax cost of debt times the percent of funding financed with debt, which would be the total value of debt over equity plus debt. Now, in theory, we'd like to get both the market value of debt and the market value of equity to calculate those equity and debt percents. In practice, it's very easy to get the market value of equity. Just look at the stock price times number of shares. Market value of debt, it's very difficult to get the market value of every loan and bond that the firm has. So in fact, we'll probably use the book value of debt or the uh, the accounting uh, balance sheet value for debt. So let's talk about cost of debt. What return do our bondholders or debt holders in general demand? There's three ways we're going to use to calculate that. One is we can just look at the average yield on existing bonds or loans. Two is we can look at the average yield on bonds uh, uh, issued by firms with similar risk, which usually means fine bonds uh, issued by companies with the same credit rating. Lastly, you can choose the historical interest expense from the balance sheet and divide it by, I'm sorry, from the income statement and divide, it by, divide that by the total debt outstanding on the balance sheet. So let's talk a little bit about cost of equity. Cost of equity is very hard to, to calculate. Now, if we look backwards, it's very easy to see what return you had from a given share of stock. You can just say, well, the difference between what I bought, of, bought it for, P0, and what the price is today, P1, that capital gain will be a total return, or be a return to the shareholder, plus any dividend payment paid to the shareholder. So the capital gain 
plus the dividend payment over the initial price of the stock will tell you the ex post return for a, a share of stock. Now, what's difficult about forecasting the uh, uh, expected return of a stock is unlike a bond or a loan that has a stated interest rate or coupon rate, uh, a stock has no, uh, nothing such as that. So the problem is with dividends, there's no stated dividend yield for a share of stock. The only thing a stock really promises you are really two things. You uh, get to vote on certain matters of the firm and you get a dividend if it's paid. So there's no stated rate of return for a dividend. And also the dividends, again, are, are optional payments. You only get it if the firm chooses to sell it. And also that capital gain we talked about, well, that depends on a lot of things. It depends on how the firm's doing, maybe their top line or bottom line growth. It depends on how the market reacts to a new strategy depends on the, how the market reacts to the competitive environment. And just the overall stock market will send the stock up and down. So it's a difficult thing to try to figure out what's the rate, rate, rate of return that our shareholders are demanding. The standard approach to solve this problem is a theoretical model. It's called CAPM, the Capital Asset Pricing Model, CAPM, one of the most important theories in finance. And what this CAPM model does, it solves our problem of needing a cost of equity, a required return for stock. And what this does is CAPM relates the expected return or required return of a stock to its market risk. So what does this mean? Like every good theory, the theory is going to start with a bunch of uh, assumptions. And one of the main assumptions for CAPM is that rash as investors are rationally diversified. In other words, no one's dumb enough to own one stock. Everyone holds a very large basket of stocks, say the S&P 500 or the global S&P 500. Therefore, if you're looking at the risk of any individual stock, you can't just look at a measure, measure of uh, the total risk of an individual stock, which would probably be measured by something like standard deviation. What you'd pro have to do is for any one of your shareholders are already rationally diversified into a a large market portfolio, say the S&P 500. So what you have to do is get a measure of risk for an individual stock that relates to how it would affect the total risk of a diversified portfolio. That measure is called beta. And how you can calculate beta historically is to plot some data like this. So here's a graph. Here's the return on the market, say the S&P 500. And this is measuring the return on, say, Walmart stock. And this data point here says that on this, on this day or this month, Walmart had this return and the market had this. And on this day here, market, uh, Walmart had this return and the market had that return. And on this day here and so on. So we have hundreds of data points here. We will fit a, re a regression line, right? a best fit line through that data. And what that does is shows the relationship, the returns of Walmart and individual stock and the market. The slope of that line is called beta. That is going to be our measure of risk. We call it a measure of market risk. Now, if beta is one, by definition, that means it has the same risk of the market. It will not increase the risk of my diversified market portfolio. And what also means for a beta of one, it means that the stock market up is stock market is up one percent today. Your stock is probably up one percent also. Now, when a beta is less than one, I'm sorry, greater than one. Say the beta is two. If the beta is two. That means that line has a higher slope. And what that means is the market's up one. Your stock is up two. And if the beta is less than one, say the beta is 0 0.5. That means the slope is lower. That means if the market is up or down one, your stock is up or down one half. So in, in summary, the CAPM model is a model that relates the, uh, the, return, the expected return of a stock to its market risk. And the reason why it's, you only use its market risk is because shareholders are rationally diversified. Therefore, we need to measure how it affects the total risk of a diversified portfolio. The measure of risk is going to be measured by fitting a best fit line through uh, historical observations of the excess returns of the market and your stock. 
once you have that beta, that beta between the stock and the market, here's our formula, one of the most uh, uh, famous formula, formulas in finance. The re required return of a stock, we call it KE, is going to be at least equal to the risk-free rate, right? Because the stock's a risky asset. So you have to get at least the risk-free rate of return or you wouldn't hold it. So the required rate of return is at least the risk-free risk free rate of return plus our measure of risk beta times the compensation per unit of risk. And that's going to be called the market risk premium. And how you calculate it, it's the expected return of the total market minus the risk-free rate. So it's the, it's the extra compensation the market, market has over the risk-free rate over our measure of the market risk. Now, how we get these uh, numbers in practice? Risk-free rate, generally we're looking at the rate of return of a long-term treasury. The beta, we'll generally use uh, a historical um, regression. And then for the market risk premium, what we have is uh, 100 years or so of data of the stock market. So historically, that stock market has returned you know, maybe uh, four, five, six, seven, eight percent, depending on what time horizon we're looking at. That market is uh, the market has been six, seven, eight, nine percent above treasuries. Well, we're going to talk about one other way of calculating beta, though. This beta looks at an individual stock and just looks at its relationship to the market. The problem with calculating betas for individual stocks is those betas tend to be very unstable and vary with the firm's life cycle. In other words, young startup firms tend to have high betas and then their betas become closer to the market as they get uh, more in a steady state, mature stage. Also, those betas change often. If you look at a, a one year or two year or three year windows, those, those betas can change. So one alternative to using a stock beta is to just calculate the beta of an entire industry's average stock return for all its indiv uh, industry uh, individual stock components and just calculate the beta based on the industry's return versus the market. And the idea is every firm in that in industry is facing the same business risk. However, there's a problem with this. Even say, say several firms are in say the uh, oil and gas industry. Well, some of those firms, they all have the basic underlying exposure to the economy and to, say, uh, oil and gas prices. However, each individual firm might have different uh, leverage, more debt or less debt. So therefore, uh, the returns of any individual stock depend on both what industry, in, industry they're in, but also what their leverage is. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to calculate a beta for the industry by running a regression. However, we're going to unlever a beta by this formula right here. We're going to take that beta and divide by 1 plus the after-tax DDE industry of the, I'm sorry, DDE ratio of the industry. That will give me an unlevered beta for the industry. In other words, what would the beta of that industry be if it had no debt? Now we'll have the beta of a no debt firm in our industry. We're going to relever it using this formula. Take our unlevered industry beta and multiply times 1 plus the after tax DDE ratio of the firm. Now, what does this do for us? It, the unlevered beta for the industry captures the business, the industry risk, the underlying business risk. And then by levering it by the firm's DDE ratio, it's going to capture the firm's financial risk. So let's go ahead and do this for whimsical using some some uh, some data that we're going to uh, uh, that's being that's being supplied. So let's take a look. So here's our whimsical valuation model right here. But we have a little bit more data up here I've put up here. I've put the book value of net debt we're going to have to use that because there's no way to, to find out the market value of the debt. We have the market value of equity. There's a million shares outstanding at $10 a share. That's $10 million. Tax rate is 40%. Cost of 
cost of debt is 10% for Whimsical. However, we're going to try to calculate the whack of Whimsical. So what we're going to need is get us the, the cost of equity. So what we're going to do is use that second method that I suggested. We are going to run a regression. How we're going to do that in Excel is we're going to say equal slope. And we're going to get the reg regression coefficient and put in our y variables, which is, say, the industry for whimsical, comma, the x variable, the market. And that slope, that 1.7278, that regression coefficient, that's the slope of the best fit line. Now, let's, let's look at this visually. And I'm just going to add a graph. I'm going to highlight both this, these columns. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert an XY scatter graph. So I'm going to insert XY scatter. And here's my data. Here are my data points. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the data. So here's the return on the stock, X axis return on the market. I'm going to click on a data point, right click, add a trend line. That's going to be the best fit regression line. I'm going to hit display equation. And I have my regression coefficient. And you can see that regression coefficient right here of 1.7278 times X, where X is the return on the market. So that slope there is just giving me the slope of this line. Now the industry, let's just say the industry DDE ratio is 0.48 and the industry tax rate is 42%. Now using the formula I just gave you, I can take the levered industry beta. Now I'm, why I'm saying levered is this data is collected from the firms in the industry's returns. It's the average returns of the individual firms in that industry. Those returns are based on the stock moves, and, and some of those firms must have debt. They must be, they are levered, all right? Levered by definition, definition means they have debt. So I'm going to take the levered beta divided by 1 plus the after-tax DDE ratio of the industry, and I get what the beta of the industry would be if they had no debt. And it makes sense it would be lower. This is the sensitivity of the stock with its debt. This is the sensitivity if the stocks in the industry had no debt. So back to my WAC calculation. I need a beta to use in my CAPM formula to get cost of equity. What I'm going to do is use the CAPM formula. However, the beta I'm going to use is not the regression of, say, whimsical against the S&P 500. What I'm going to do is take the unlevered industry beta, because that really captures the business risk, and multiply times 1 plus whimsical's after-tax DDE ratio. So there's the tax rate. There's whimsical's DDE ratio. So now I have my 1.54, that's my 1 plus the after-tax DDE ratio. I now can calculate my cost of equity, which is going to be the risk-free rate and I assume it's 5% right here, plus my levered beta times the market risk premium. I'm going to assume that the average return on the market is going to be 6% of over the treasuries. So that gives me 1426. I'm then going to put that in my WAC formula. And notice here I've calculated the equity percent, which is equity over debt plus equity and one minus that must be the debt percent. So I'm gonna calculate my WAC. Equity percent times cost of equity plus 
my KD, 10% times one minus the tax rate because of the tax yield, times my debt percent, and I get 12.66%. So let's summarize. For whimsical, I'm going to calculate the WAC. I'm going to use a cost of debt of 10%, which is the rate of return, uh, or the, uh, the the rate on their bonds, or or the on their loans. I'm going to calculate the cost of equity using the CAPM model, which is the risk-free rate plus beta times market risk premium. The beta, how I'm going to calculate is I'm going to use for them. I'm going to use an industry. Uh, uh, market returns, I'm sorry, industry returns. I'm going to compare that to the S&P 500 returns and calculate a regression coefficient or a best fit line through the data. In this, turn, in this case, it turns out to be 172. That would be the levered industry beta. I'm going to unlever the industry beta by using the after-tax uh, DD ratio of the industry, and that would tell me the beta of the industry if they had no debt. I'm then going to re-lever the beta of the industry by using the after-tax DDE ratio of Whimsical. So that would tell me the, uh, the beta of Whimsical if they have average industry business risk, but the financial risk of Whimsical's DDE. I plugged in, in my CAPM formula, I got my cost of equity, and then I calculated my WAC. And what it turned out to be is 12.66%. And by the way, that 12.66%, that is the exact rate of return that we should be using to discount the free cash flows to the firm. Remember, free cash flows to the firm are cash flows available to pay debt and equity holders. Therefore, WAC, which is the weighted average return of the debt and equity holders, is the appropriate discount rate to use for those cash flows. Therefore, I'll take the present value of free cash flows to the firm, in this case with the growth perpetuity, Take the present value, that's the total value of the enterprise. I then subtract out my net debt, that is the total value of equity, and divide by number of shares. And likewise down here, while using the uh, EBITDA multiple, I still use the same methodology. So this is, how, this is the discount rate you'll use to discount the free cash flows of the firm to come up with the equity valuation. All right, now we're gonna do is we're gonna do this the same uh, procedure except we're going to do it for a real stock Walmart and then we're going to do a quick valuation of Walmart so let's look at Walmart's cost of debt we're going to do method one let's just look at bond yields uh, for Walmart so you can see this says Walmart stores this is from uh, Morningstar and what Morningstar shows is a bunch of Walmart bonds and if I take an average of a bunch of their long-term bonds their rate of return, their, their uh, rate that we calculated in the last lecture is about 3.76%. So I can use 3.76%, uh, kind of the rate of return of Walmart bonds. A second method, Walmart has a double A credit rating uh, from S&P. If you look at the S&P credit ratings, triple A are the highest rated. And what you see is double A are pretty high rated bonds. In fact, if you look at a, uh, a, a, a split in the ratings, anything above the triple B minus for S&P is something called investment grade. Anything below is called speculative or junk. So Walmart is pretty far up there. They're one of the safest companies in America. Now, if you look uh, at this data, I went to Yahoo Finance and looked at bonds and at composite bond rates. On average, long-term bonds that have double A ratings are about 387. So that's pretty close to 376. So that's a second way to, to uh, get a rating for a firm. That way you just kind of look at a bunch of bonds uh, from firms that have similar risk. The last way, you can compute the historical interest expense and divide by debt in the balance sheet. This generally is not the preferred method for several reasons. One, it doesn't distinguish between short-term and long-term borrowing. Two, it doesn't account for debt retirements that don't show up on your imbalance sheets. In other words, when you just take interest expense over average balances, 
uh, that debt could have been put, put on January 1st or December 30th. That's where you're really going to skew the rate of return. Also, the interest rate on the on paying on the debt uh, doesn't account for some maybe special bond terms. And we'll talk later about there's bonds that are called convertible bonds and callable bonds and collateral bonds or collateralized bonds or floating rate bonds. So we don't really know what that interest rate really means because it could be uh, a low interest rate because there's special provisions in the bond. Also, just functionally, uh, when you observe the balance sheet or income statement, they don't always separate interest expense from interest income. So if you just put look at net interest expense from the interest or from the interest expense line on the income statement, there may be some interest income in there that's offsetting the interest expense, and then you divide it by the ba debt balance, and you get a really low number. So this should be a last resort. So we're not even going to look at it for Walmart. All right. So we now have our cost of debt. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to use the 387. It's pretty close to the other method of 376, and it's based on kind of an average risk of the industry. All right. Next, we need a risk-free rate. I just looked up the 10-year Treasury yield from Yahoo Finance, and it's 1.7%. Next, I need a market risk premium. Now, the market risk premium, you can look at the historical return of the stock market over bonds. And if you go from, nine, and this is from DeModeran's website, and from 1928 to 2015, it's about 6% over treasury bonds. Actually, much more recently, 1966 to 2015, you know, closer to the last 50 years, it's only been about 4%. However, uh, DeModeran also has another thing you can look at, DeModeran looks at a valuation of the overall stock market and then gets an implied market risk premium, which he gets at about 6%. So I'm going to probably use about 6% for this valuation. So what does this mean? The risk-free rate I'm going to use is 1.7%. The market risk premium is 6% I'm going to use. I'm just going to round it out to 6%. Therefore, what that means is if I have a current long-term treasury of 1.7 and the average return of the market is going to be 6 over treasury, that really means what I'm predicting is a 7.7% return on the market. And if we're looking at a stock that has a beta of 1, the average risk of the market, that means that an average stock should have a 7.7% return. Now I'm going to calculate betas for Walmart. So what I did for you already, I went to finance.yahoo.com. I put in the stock symbol for Walmart, which is WMT. I, I clicked on or selected historical prices. I then asked for monthly prices from 2011 to 2016. And then I downloaded the data. I selected download. And then I captured the adjusted closing price. Now that adjusted closing price includes the effects of dividends. So it actually, if you take the change in an adjusted closing price from month to month, it includes both the capital gain and the dividend. Therefore, it's a measure of its total return. So here's the data. I got the Walmart's adjusted prices. I've got S&P 500 adjusted prices. And I have annual treasury yields. Based on that, we can calculate betas for Walmart. So let's go back to our Excel file. I'm going to click on the Walmart WAC tab. And here I have our data here. This is simply our S&P 500 returns by month, I'm sorry, prices by month, Walmart adjusted prices by month, and these are annualized treasury yields, 1.75 to 7%. I then calculate the monthly return of the S&P 500 just by taking the May price minus the April price of the April price percent change copy that down. I got my monthly market re, uh, Walmart returns and then I have my monthly treasury yield uh, treasury returns by just taking this 1.75 percent and dividing by a hundred. Notice I had to divide by a hundred to determine it in percents. Now what I have here are the monthly excess returns. This is the returns of the market minus the monthly risk-free rate and the return of Walmart minus the monthly risk-free rate of return. Now, if I were to just take this data and graph it, I can just select all that data, 
come back up here. Let me zoom out a little bit. And I'm going to insert an XY scatter graph. I'll put that right there. So as long as I put the market on the left and the stock on the right, that should get the uh, what roll y and x-axis correct. Now what I can do is I can add a trend line. Right click on a data point, add trend line, and display on chart. And where there is our regression formula. 0.218, the return on y, which is Walmart, it historically has been 0 0.0034 plus 0.218 times return on the market. So 0.218 is the beta for this five-year period of Walmart. Or we can run a regression and get the same values. So what I can do is I can go to data, data analysis, click on regression, hit OK. I'm going to do my Y value variables, which is my stock. I'm going to include the word WMT there. I'm going to get my X variables. Doesn't matter where I start. I'll just make sure I come back up to the top. I'm going to click on labels since that first cell I highlighted has have uh, labels in it. I'm going to do an output range. I'm going to have that data put right here. And I'm going to hit OK. And what I see here is the R squared, or the adjusted R squared of that is 0 0.0087. That's really low. But there's my beta, the, the, the regression coefficient, 0.21799, or 0.218. A third way we can calculate it, which is the easy way, which is the way you're always going to do it, is just say equal slope. And put in the stock market's returns. Don't use the, don't use the label. And then put in the market returns. And there's my 0.218. Now I can calculate my cap M risk free rate plus beta times my market risk premium. And that's my that could be my KE for Walmart, but my goodness, doesn't that look really low? And doesn't that look that beta look really low? You would think that Walmart would have risk that's closer to the market since Walmart's almost the size of the market, right? And so I did a little test. Here's the full beta over the five years. Here's the beta in 2015, 2016, just looking at the 2016 or 14 data. 2013, it was one. And 2012, it was negative 0.6. So this is the problem with regression betas. Look how it's jumping around. Negative 0.6, 1.07, 0.84, negative 0.26, and the whole five years, 0.22. So I'm really uncomfortable with this beta. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use an industry beta. What I looked at is going back to the Dermoderan website. Dermoderan actually allows me to just uh, look by industry and get unlevered betas by industry. And I noticed that the unlevered betas for Retail, general retail, and grocery are 0.92 and 0.77. And if you look at Walmart's sales from their financial uh, annual report, 50% of their sales come from general retail and 50% from groceries. So I took an average of 50% of the retail beta and 50% of the grocery beta. So I got an unlevered beta, since this says unlevered, Unlevered beta of 0.85. I'm going to use that beta as the unlevered beta for Walmart and lever it based on Walmart's DDE ratio. Now here's from some data from Walmart, uh, Yahoo Finance. 
Walmart had a market cap of equity of 200 billion. They had debt of 50 billion and cash of 8 billion, which gave it 41.3 billion of net debt. That gave it a D to E ratio of 0.203. And then I'm going to relever their beta based on their after tax D to E. So 0.845 is the uh, average uh, unlevered beta for the industry. I'm going to relever it based on Walmart's after tax DD ratio, and I'm going to get a Walmart uh, levered beta. So let me go back to my spreadsheet. So here's my data. That's the average of those two betas we just talked about. There's market cap of debt, market cap of equity. There's my corporate tax rate. There's my DDE ratio, which is just net debt over E. So I'll calculate my levered beta for Walmart. I'll take the unlevered industry beta times one plus the after tax DDE ratio. And that says Walmart should have a beta of 0.96 if it has the average industry industry risk and that financial risk. I'll then use my cap M on that beta and say equal to the risk-free rate, which is over here, plus my market risk premium times my beta. So risk-free rate plus my market risk premium times my beta. I'm gonna get rid of some of those decimal points. And there we go. My estimate of Walmart's cost of equity is 7.5% using the industry unlevered beta and relevering it based on Walmart's D to E. Now I can calculate Walmart's WAC. Remember I said I wanna use a 3.87% cost of debt. Here's my debt percent and equity percent for Walmart. Just take my D over my D plus E and my E over my D plus E. So my WAC is now my equity percent times my cost of equity plus my debt percent times my cost of debt after tax, one minus the tax rate. So there is my Walmart whack. 6.69%. I could do a little sensitivity analysis around that. I could just put on a data table here the formula I use for WAC. Notice it went away because I just made the text white. So it makes it go away. But I can leave it there. But it's nice to change the text to white for printing your table. I made a bunch of KDs around my 387. I made a bunch of unlevered wax around my 0.845. I can highlight this data or this table area. I can hit data, what if, data table. Now the row here are KDs. So let's find that original KD. There. There it is. So columns are unlevered betas. That's right here. Hit OK. And now I have a sensitivity analysis of different wax. If I varied KD from 327 to 447 and varied unlevered betas from 0.245 to 1.045. So now I can value Walmart. And what I did is I looked up Walmart, Walmart's EBIT last year, 22 billion, tax rate of 30%, depreciation of 10 billion, capex of 10.6 billion, and let's just assume no working capital change for simplicity. That will give it a free cash flow to the firm of EBIT times one minus the tax rate. minus capex plus depreciation minus a change in working capital. 
So Walmart last year had free cash flows the firm of $15.48 billion. Let's assume a perpetual growth rate of 2%. That means next year's cash flows are going to be that plus 1 plus 2%. So my next year's cash flows are $15.79 billion. Since those cash flows will assume we're paid in one year, I'm going to take next year's cash flow over my WAC, my discount rate, Six point six one minus my growth rate assumption, two percent. So there's my growth perpetuity formula. So Walmart, the total value of Walmart's uh, enterprise is worth three hundred thirty-seven billion dollars. There are two point nine nine billion shares of Walmart outstanding. So if I were to take Walmart equity value or enterprise value, whoops, let me do an open paren. Walmart enterprise value minus net debt I had that net debt somewhere there it is 41 divided by number of shares outstanding I get $98.98 a share that is my intrinsic value of Walmart. Again, how I got that is I take my enterprise value, which is the present value of all free cash flows, discounted at WAC using growth perpetuity formula. That is free cash flows of the firm over WAC minus G. Take that total value minus net debt, divide by number of shares. I get $98, therefore the stock appears to be undervalued. I can then do a data table. Well, it looks like I got it messed up here. Let's just go to the back to the PowerPoint, take a look at it. I can then do a sensitivity analysis. And if I vary WAC from 569 to 769 and vary terminal growth rate from negative 1% to 5%, I get valuations from $45 to $777. Again, we're never going to use growth rates greater than the growth of the economy. So I really don't believe any of these. So really I'm getting, really I'm getting valuations between say $45 and about $180. Stock is currently selling for about $80, $86. So it, it seems to be relatively fairly priced given the uncertainty I have. You know, where I really think the stock price is probably, what my, I think it's really worth is probably in this neighborhood probably in that $70 to $140 range. So $86, it seems like it's relatively fairly priced. Two other things I did, I used Goal Seek, where I set my valuation of Walmart, right, my, the, the cell that has the $98 in it, set that to, ten, to the market price of uh, $86.22, I just plugged that in there, by changing the um, growth rate and my break-even growth rate is 1.4%. In other words, all else equal, if growth is greater than 1.4%, it's a buy. Growth is less than 1.4%, it's a sell. But my break-even, if growth is exactly 1.4% terminal growth, then Walmart is fairly priced. I did one other break-even. I set the valuation, right, that sell, the sell here again, I set this cell equal to 80, the market price of $86 by changing WAC. Now what I actually had to do is I had to replace the WAC formula with its value because you can only run goal seek on values. But when I did that and I ran the goal seek, that told me that the based on my free cash flow estimates and the current market price of Walmart, if you bought it at the current market price, you would get a 7.28 percent return. In other words, you can think of that as the break-even break -even whack. So in this topic, we calculate the cost of capital for a firm, namely the weighted average cost of capital. We use that weighted average cost of capital to value of equity. Here's our final worksheet.
and I look forward to our next topic.